Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Field. On the program today, Philip Leroux, the uh, editor of Minute Dot uh, and uh, a uh, personal financial planner, also a renowned and published poet who makes rhymes <laughs> or writes in free verse. I'm not sure which. Anyway, uh, welcome to the show. Also, Jason McPhee, who is an uh, engineer from the, uh, for, for the uh, state of California. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're on uh, the uh, web at www.accesssacramento.org, on YouTube, on Channel 17 in Sacramento, and now on Facebook. So look for us on Facebook at Libertarian Counterpoint. Type that in, in the search bar, and there we are. Um, the 2016 election was unique for libertarians in that uh, the uh, libertarian presidential ticket, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, uh, polled as high as, I think, 13% at, at the peak uh, and uh, ended up getting 3-4% of the, of, the, of the vote, which was uh, an all-time record for the Libertarian Party. Uh, and they did it with, with two governors, but Gary Johnson, who was also the nominee in 2012, who uh, insisted on getting Bill Weld, the former governor of Massachusetts, as his running mate. You know, the idea being two executives, two, uh, two former governors, uh, a, a very uh, centrist-type libertarian campaign was the idea. And uh, I thought Bill Weld did a pretty good job. I mean, he won the nomination by, just by, on the second ballot by, you know, just a few votes. And he did a fairly good job, but he made a few gaffes, as did Gary Johnson. One of Bill Weld's gaffes was saying that, uh, uh, saying nice things about Hillary Clinton, which did not go over well with the rank and file of libertarians. Interestingly enough, unlike some previous libertarian uh, presidential candidates, Bob Barr comes to mind, as does uh, his uh, VP running mate uh, back, uh, back in the, whenever that was. Uh, Bill Weld is still a libertarian. He's still waving the libertarian banner. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was kind of interesting because I think he made his conversion to becoming a libertarian shortly before going through the nomination. At the convention. Ball. Yes, exactly. Essentially. And, uh, and, and now he was uh, recently interviewed, and I guess he said he's sticking with the Libertarian Party. And it, it, it's, uh, I, I think it's a good story overall. Um, you know, I, I, he was a very polished candidate, and we have so few uh, people at the national level who have, um, who have notoriety at that level who uh, can handle themselves well in public. And so he uh, you know, is a, a big asset to the party, I think. Um, some of the things that concern some libertarians, though, is, is some of his views don't seem to be consistent with libertarian views. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind uh, uh, quickest is the I issue with uh, the um, that came up during the campaign where they talked about uh, w would a baker be willing to bake a cake? No, that was Gary Johnson more. That was more it Gary Johnson. was, but he was also, yeah. you know, made his position clear that he was uh, essentially in but line it, with But face Gary it, Johnson I mean, that's more that. of a centrist position. Not that it's, I agree with it, I don't. But. It's a centrist, but I guess one of the, the key parts of a libertarian philosophy is that uh, markets work and markets can sort these types of things out and to say that government has to come in and do it sort of undercuts a lot of the underpinning of a lot yeah, of that's more, that's, I mean, that issue, is, I mean, although I guess important, is, is really more of a hot-button pusher than it is anything else. It's not really a significant issue for, for anybody other than people that want somebody that doesn't want them to bake a cake to bake a cake for them. Uh, you know, it doesn't affect a whole lot of people. It's kind of a non-consequential issue. The consequential issue, or two consequential issues, where Bill Weld was a little bit off the, uh, off the plantation were, one, he was a little bit, a little bit squishy on gun control, at least in, early in his career. And second, he was, uh, and still is, I think, a little bit prone to the idea that the United States should be uh, projecting force abroad uh, in a, uh, in a, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, he doesn't like the idea that we're in Afghanistan for, for eternity or that we, you know, are involved, still involved in Iraq and Syria and so forth. But he does make some apologies for the militaristic uh, world policeman position of the United States. Well, I think he mentioned that, uh, you know, he was quoted in that recent interview uh, just days ago that he doesn't mind airstrikes, but he doesn't want boots on the ground, which... You that know, sounds almost, a like, problem. almost like uh, Bill Clinton uh, in, in, in Serbia. You know, uh, he was also, um, as you said, squishy on uh, marijuana legalization, which was a, you know, a real uh, departure from libertarian uh, views. So more of that law and order you know, drug... Uh, yeah, well, he was a former prosecutor. You know, so, uh, and even now he sounds as if, he's, as if to say, well, I can give on that point, but I think uh, in his heart of hearts he's still sort of uh, anti-legalization. 
so I think that's the one particularly with Gary Johnson, you know, being a, uh, uh, a noted, or pothead as he described himself, that, uh, that that was a very odd combination. Uh, uh, but, you know, I, I, what he's saying is, what Weld is saying is that, hey, you know, there, I'm not going to be a perfect libertarian, but I am a libertarian. Well, it's interesting. Gary Johnson has very uh, decisively said, I'm not a candidate for anything anymore. I'm done. Uh, Bill Weld has not closed that door, and 2020 is rolling around. Trump will be up for re-election. I don't think the Democrats are going to have any, any, any very particularly uh, uh, attractive candidate. Uh, is there a possibility that Bill Weld will uh, be able to squeak out a, a nomination that Romney could endorse? Well, this is the funny thing, is if he, if he does get the nomination for the Libertarian Party, I mean, he would be an extremely strong, incredible candidate. The question is, is, is you know, can libertarians, or are they going to give him the, the nomination, yeah. I guess? Can he get by some of these, you know, central issues of, you know, not, you know, being against the drug war and things like that, you know, so? I, I think his real problem is that uh, he doesn't he doesn't look good. <laughs> 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 yeah. Looks like a Boston patrician to me. <laughs> you know, he doesn't, he, uh, he, he, he doesn't, he's not the sort of person you look at him and listen to him speak and you think that this guy is a healthy guy who can, you know, withstand eight years, uh, is my impression. And uh, so, uh, right out of the gate, and it does matter. You know, let's face it, uh, if not precisely age, certainly vitality matters. And I, to me, Weld does not project vitality. Uh, as Trump, you know, Trump's an old guy, uh, you know, Trump projected vitality. Uh, Obama certainly projected vitality. Uh, Weld, you know. No, I didn't get that impression, but I guess everybody uh, has their own. Their well, own you know, if they get a chance to get a debate with those two, I think we'll see a little bit of fire from I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I guarantee you that Weld could hold himself, do, could do an extremely good job in, on a debate stage. The guy, the guy is smooth. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he, he is a very persuasive uh, uh, public speaker and talker and, uh, and debater. Yeah, whether they'll get, ever get on the yeah, stage. That's, that, yeah. that's, that is the question. Um, TPP, the world moves on without us. TPP, of course, being the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, how should libertarians view our inclusion or exclusion from TPP? Well, I think, uh, uh, a little bit off the libertarian track. The libertarians seem to sort of favor this trade deal. Uh, some do, some don't. I, 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 I do not. Uh, and all trade deals are possible on a bilateral basis, on a multilateral basis, uh, and I don't know why government should be the one setting those terms. Now, we get to places, uh, for instance, at the founding of the Republic, the only uh, country against which we had a tariff was England, and that was because England had one against us. So and we had just won a war against them. And well, it was purely a matter of the principle was that we would level the playing field with our trading partner. Whatever they were doing to us, we would do to them. And uh, that's a principle that could uh, hold throughout the, the generations. So when you, uh, when you say that you have a trade agreement, a preferential trade agreement, what you really mean is there are people who are excluded from the agreement. And once you've done that, you've created a conflict and you've lost an opportunity. Uh, our relations with China may be as they are now, or Russia may be as they are now. You cement that in, an, in a, in a trade, uh, trade relationship, well, who's, who can say what will happen in 20 years? And so we found that with NAFTA, and we found that with other trade agreements, that where the world is today doesn't mean where it's going to be 25 years from now. And so any kind of a trade agreement, to me, is a limitation, which therefore, a limitation of trade, and therefore, you know, sort of anti-libertarian. Well, think. yeah, the best trade agreement is none. Uh, you can import or export anything that you want uh, at any price that you want, and there is no tariff, and there is no non-tariff barrier. That's the best, that's the ideal situation. That's the, that's the you know, the bona fide libertarian position. The question, of course, is, are we better off with high tariffs and trade walls and physical walls and all of the uh, uh, things that the Trump administration uh, seems to be uh, uh, arguing in favor of, or with a trade agreement that is a little bit more liberal than, than you know, basically shutting down the, 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 shutting down the borders. Well, and let's not forget, too, that where this uh, stepping out of TPP came from was uh, essentially Trump's rhetoric, which was protectionist and saying that we're being raped by everybody else in our trade. So. Um, you know, it's uh, 
you know, I, I, I can definitely sympathize with uh, Philip on this that, you know, it's sort of like why do we need somebody to manage our trade, but on the other hand, if this uh, is a step towards lower tariffs and, and uh, I guess the, the more of the free flow of goods and ideas across borders, then it's a good thing. So I, I it's... Well, and the other point to that is that many of those tariffs are, um, uh, that Trump is talking about are reactions to the tariffs that exist. So, uh, you know, there's a high tariff against our autos going into Japan. Uh, and we have no tariff against theirs coming here. And so yet that is already distorted. And the other one, the big one. But was, you know what that does? What that does, it works in the consumer's favor. Because you can buy a Toyota a heck of a lot cheaper that way. Why would we want to do anything that raises the prices of Toyotas and Hondas? Well, because uh, we cannot send our Fords to Japan. So the upshot their problem, of it, their well, loss. Well, but the, the loser upshot, there are the Japanese car buyers. Well, the upshot of it, though, is that our dollars and our manufacturing is going to Japan uh, because we can't send our cars there. So they, if they are subsidizing their cars to us, but we can't do the same to them, then we can't sell our cars to their market, but they can sell to ours. And so when you when you destroy which means the that, Jap that Japanese consumers lose, American consumers win. Well, now that not so much Japanese so not so much Japanese for cars. Not, not so uh, uh, Japanese can buy Japanese cars. Yeah, but so they're going to they're going to but they're, but they're going to be paying car. more for Japanese cars because Chevy isn't competing with them. Well, let's say the Ford or Chevy has a better car. And but, but oh. uh, a Japanese consumer can't buy it because it's thirty percent more expensive. Except that actually they're not a better car. But, but that's the point, that is the principle, yeah. is that if Chevy makes a better car, it still can't compete against uh, whatever the Toyota. Yeah. So ideally, what you want is to say whatever's going on here is going on here, and that was actually the founding principle. Uh, and That may have been the founding principle. The libertarian principle is no trade barriers. It, or none, n none or, e or equal. Uh, with libertarianism, it would be great if there were none, yeah. obviously. I think uh, one of the best principles to help guide libertarians on this is one of the uh, best quotes Ronald Reagan had is when he said, you know, look, if you're in your trading partner, you're both in the same boat. If they pull out a gun and shoot a hole in it, you know, it doesn't do you any good to stand up and shoot a hole in the boat, too. <laughs> and, so, so and, that, and that's what we essentially do. We shoot exactly. ourselves in the if foot. It's tit for tat, then. Yeah. 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 Uh, the immigration diversity lottery is getting a lot of press these days. Uh, and uh, Jason, should it be or, uh, or not? Well, uh, with this immigration lottery, the thing came up when people were scratching their heads about the terrorist in New York who ran a truck through a bunch of cyclists and, and killed some people. And I guess he was a beneficiary of this diversity lottery. So, uh, you know, that brought the issue into public view of whether or not we should have this program. I, I think from a libertarian perspective, I mean, you know, a lot of these rules are fairly silly. It's why have some artificial lottery? Why not just have a system? If, we have people here who want to hire somebody and somebody wants to come here to work, you know. Uh, who, why should anybody be standing in the way of that consensual relationship? So, I, you know, to me, that's the best lottery, the one where people get to sort of line up their interests and meet consensually. And, and, and I, I, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, there was simply no limitation really on immigration. That's Ellis Island, for goodness sakes. Uh, and there's no question there's a whole school of thought to which I subscribe that unlimited immigration would be phenomenal for our economy. Yeah, now you can make the argument that you can't have unlimited immigra immigration and uh, a full-blown welfare system like we, like we do have, right. or at least you can't uh, allow immigrants to take advantage of it. Now, uh, you know, and, and we would, of course, argue, get rid of the full-blown wel welfare exactly. system. Uh, you know, the qu and then the question becomes, which comes first? And it obviously, it's pretty obvious that getting rid of welfare is, is a lot more difficult than opening up uh, borders. But even so, if you take a look at the productivity, if you take a look at the willingness to work, if you take a look at the uh, type of people who are willing to make the uh, the jump from their homeland, it's the best and the brightest that get off their duff and immigrate or emigrate. Uh, it's, not, it's not the lazy people, the, the, it's not the slackers, it's not the people that want to go on welfare, nor for the most part. There, nor is there any question of resources. You know, the United States, the land mass of the United States is something like 90% uninhabited. You know, we are so concentrated in a few cities, yeah. uh, two dozen cities, let's say. Uh, there's no question about there being enough resources or water or what, whatever it may be. 
and there is every indication that uh, the productivity produces uh, wealth and that wealth benefits everyone and we've seen it in our own history. We know this is true uh, and so any opposition to immigration underlying it is um, well, it's fear, fear of, you know, fear. fear and tribalism. I mean, if you look at it from a moral standpoint, if it's John who grew up, who grew up in San Diego or Juan that grew up in Tijuana, what's to say that uh, I in Sacramento can't hire, I, I can hire John, but I can't hire Juan? It's, a, it's, it's an arbitrary line, thing of, of an arbitrary line drawn in the desert by dead politicians and bureaucrats. And right. scarcity, uh, uh, scarcity creates uh, price increases. So if you've gotten there first, uh, well, whatever it is, if you've gotten the job uh, and you can command a high salary because there's no one else to compete with you on that job, or whether it's a home, no homes being built, your home goes up in value, and so there's a kind of a shrewd calculation to the idea of scarcity. Uh, well, you know, and, and one other thing you brought up earlier was the idea that you can't have a welfare state along with open borders. But I don't know that we have to say that we have to address the whole welfare state uh, issue at the same time. I mean, why not have a different welfare system for immigrants than you do for citizens? And then, you know, you could, you could, uh, you know, if people know what the deal is up front and they come voluntarily, then it's a plus for them, regardless of, of why they can't. You might run into constitutional uh, equal protection of the law questions on that. Well, but, if they're, but, they're not but not citizens. Not for not citizens. Yeah. I asked a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all of that is resolved um, at, uh, the, to have something like that at a national level, or even a state level on the size of California. Those are the sorts of issues should, that should be worked out at local levels. Uh, local taxation, uh, county, city level, so that somebody comes in, you look around in Sacramento, we have a huge homeless problem, You look, we look around at this problem, we own it, and we say, what can we do about it? How much money would I be willing to give for my own self-interest to in some way alleviate the homeless problem? And now you've got a voluntary system. But to do a welfare system at a national level, or even, I would argue, at a state level the size of California, um, is that's where you're going to fall down. Regardless. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole idea. If you, in a family, we're all socialists because we give everything needed to the infant in the family and the infant produ produces nothing, you know. Right. Karl Marx, from each according to their ability to each, or from each according to their ability to each according to their need. That's socialism at the family level, where it works. It absolutely works because nothing else would work. Right. You can't, you can't allow a two-year-old to fend for himself. At the tribal level, it still works because pretty much everybody knows everybody. But once you get beyond exactly. a community of 50 or 100 or 200 people, it doesn't work because the free rider problem intrudes. You could even argue that uh, it works at much larger levels. Um, the smallest countries in the world have their resources, but they're also listed as some of the happiest. And eight, even at five million, uh, I mean, once you see, it seems like when we look across the world and we get above 10 million, that's when it becomes unmanageable. But even at five million... It's going to depend on the culture, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, some of this socialism, I, I guess I'd push back just a little bit, although it, def it definitely works better at the smaller level than the larger level. However, uh, even at a tribal level, you're starting to infringe upon people's freedoms. When you start to put things in a commons and you start to tell people, hey, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And pretty soon, you know, you're, you're starting to... Well, yeah, to you have a hierarchy. Exactly, uh, yeah. Hierarchy. But you do have mobility. <laughs> And that's the key to, um, you know, to choice. When one of those choices might be socialism in a, in a community, that you have the mobility if you're not one of the people that chooses it to go. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's, what, that's the solution. If you're not going to participate in the community, you're exiled. You're, you're shunned. You're, you're yeah. kicked out. Um, the census is not coming up uh, ostensibly until 2020. It's every 10 years, right? But now we're seeing the, 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 the government is already spending money on it? What's, what's going on there, Phil? Uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's getting to be a much larger sum of money. Um, the census cost, uh, I think it was $9 billion, uh, in 2010. And the... the, the uh, nine with a B? Nine with a B. And now Actually, thinking, I think it was 13. That was it 12? <laughs> 13 it's 12 and they're projecting it to be something like 16. Yeah. And uh, so it's going to have a substantial increase uh, when you would think that te technology would enable, you know, real cost cutting. The problem is nobody will participate in it. Uh, and uh, so where participation was something like 76% who were willing to answer a mail 
uh, you know, Mayo questionnaire. Now that number was down to 63%. And that means that they got to go knocking on doors at 13%. The census itself is um, actually crucial. And it is, you know, uh, guaranteed. Well, it's crucial if you want, if, for businesses to get free information. Well, it's crucial in a lot of sense uh, for, for demographics, for a movement of population, for a sense of where our age groups are. Um, All very nice information, but information that's used primarily by business for business purposes, business purposes that they could do their own research to find out that information and should. Well, and we're all business, you know, I mean, all of us earn a living or we should or thereabouts, but uh, even on the government side of, you know, talking about benefits and all that, but <clears throat> the census itself was thought to be as crucial as the post office. By well, the it was, fathers. I mean, the original purpose of the census was to count noses for voting, for, for uh, apportionment. For knowing who, you know, how many people, how, how, how big of an army could we raise if we needed to? Well, no, for how many, how many, uh, how many uh, uh, representatives your state got. That's yeah. what, that was the original purpose. Right, yeah. Well, in, in, in the end, too, I mean, uh, you know, if, if we are going to have some government, you, you have to be able to make decisions. And what are you going to be able to make decisions on if you don't even know how many people or where they are in your country? So, I mean, that's, I think, was part of the, the thinking of the Founding Fathers. But, uh, you know, it, it is terrible, I mean, to even look farther at this trend in spending. In 1970, it was a quarter of a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and it has is, it is increased to $13 billion in 2010. And they'd actually projected lower than $13 billion, but you know, three or four years ahead of the 2020, they already realized they're short about three. I mean, billion. I mean, really, so. I don't like the idea of answering the long form census. It's very intrusive and they ask a lot of pesky, uh, none of your business questions. But have they heard of Facebook? And, right. <laughs> and, and, and the CIA and the, you know, and the well, 17 they, intelligence agencies, they know all this stuff sure. already. So. Exactly. So why, why, are they, why, are they, why are they spending $13 billion to, you know, to hand count? Well, and that's the thing. It's exponential cost increases while government is doing this and exponential cost decreases in technology at the same time. It just sort of makes no sense. Well, and you know, you know, uh, uh, that they do say that government is working on 1970s sort of technology. I mean, they're that far behind at the federal level. I, I think the state, they may even be doing better, but I, at the federal level, they really are working with floppy disks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, the first church of artificial intelligence. That sounds really intriguing to me. I need some artificial intelligence. That's why it sounds intriguing. But go on. Well, apparently, uh, I, I believe it was an executive from Google started this uh, church. And, Tours well? Uh, I, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the idea was is that uh, I guess they, they believe that AI is essentially going to be our god in the future, I think, is, is what I got from the article. And so, it, you know, and why it needs to be a religion, well, that's, that's more of a, you know, government tax issue, I guess. <laughs> and so, so they've uh, gotten tax-exempt status from the IRS in order to, you know, uh, be able to, uh, you know... I Worship guess, iRobot? What? I guess, and, and keep the funds that iRobot generates for them. <laughs> so, yeah, but, uh, yeah, it, it is uh, interesting, though, because it seems like there's a little bit of parallel to this when... It's sort of the scandals of how people go to the IRS to claim religious status in order to, to get those tax benefits. And the IRS, even though they don't define what a religion is, they have a lot of criteria, like a place to worship. Do they have Sunday services and all this? So, of course, uh, you know, you have these entities sometimes that w weren't a religion, and suddenly they're a religion because it... Uh, Gives them tax so the IRS status. position is, I, I don't know what uh, religion is, but I know it when I see it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this this is sort of what happened with Scientology a while back, too. Scientology was uh, uh, fighting for tax-exempt status about 20 years ago, I believe. And Which was, was a, a, a religion totally invented by L. Ron Hubbard, a science fiction writer. Exactly. One, and the funny thing was, I mean, remember my Because grandfather... he thought it would be a good scam. <laughs> well, I remember and my grandfather telling me about, about this, too, but they used to specifically advertise, we are not a religion when he first started this stuff up but when you know the executives later on realized hey we could be a religion if there's some money in it so. and the thing is, I don't believe Scientology ever acknowledged uh, you know a, um, a divine being or anything like that. it was a self-help group it was you know that's basically what it amounted to uh, and uh, so uh, he, I think that the the Scientology case forced this AI case to acknowledge AI as a godhead 
<laughs> that they had to say that AI had a godhead, and therefore... Uh, so the, this computer chip is a godhead. The, yeah. the infinite brain, as my son calls Google, the infinite <laughs> brain. <laughs> okay. China is building uh, a, a hypersonic wind tunnel, testing uh, aircraft design that would uh, produce an aircraft that would be able to fly from China to the West Coast in 14 minutes. Is the United States empire about to uh, dissolve uh, <laughs> uh, in the face of, of, of uh, a, a newly uh, formed Chinese empire? Well, uh, those efforts are all around the world, and most notably, and we have had our own wind project, but most notably, I think, uh, is um, uh, Elon Musk of Tesla has had this proposal for the bullet train in California that he's building. Uh, regardless, it's based on wind, and it's based on, you know... Uh, oh, the Hyperloop. The Hyperloop. Okay. And uh, I think his cousin is built, actually building it. And, um, Which would be uh, a heck of a lot better than the, than the high-speed and, and it's <laughs> And it's going. I mean, it, it started as a project, as a uh, uh, prize for anyone who could put a design together, and they opened it to the colleges and that kind of thing, and they finally, uh, they came up with the design that they thought would work, tested it, and it does work. And, you know, the whole idea is just, pushing that air. And you can go from here to there really quickly uh, at a fraction of what Brown is proposing for his high-speed rail business. So that's technology is absolutely already out there. Um, uh, it's got to be So it's not just China. That, that's a weight off my uh, shoulders. I am yes. And, and <clears throat> at the end of the day, uh, you know, we all, we have had the power to wipe each other off the face of the earth for many, many decades now. Uh, the real question is, would anyone want to do it? Hello, Kim Jong Un. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, the other thing, too, with this wind tunnel, from what I was reading in the article, is uh, prior we had the, the best wind tunnel, I guess, in Buffalo, New York, I think it was. And so this one is incrementally better than what they have in, in Buffalo. So it's, um, it's a little bit of a maybe an arms race. I don't know, I'm not sure. But. Isn't there another uh, Elon Musk uh, project to move people from? Uh, one side of the country to the other in, in, in an hour or something like that. Well, that is the, that is the hyperloop. Well, that's the hyperloop. But, but here's the, uh, what the smart guys like Musk and Bezos of Amazon and a few others, uh, 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 Branson and Virgin Atlantic, um, they, they're, all in, they're all going to space. They think, this, they think this planet is doomed. I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 this is doomed. You know, we've got, we got 20 Musk. years okay. to get out. <laughs> Thank you very much for being part of the show. See you again next week. Same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint, www.accesssacramento.org, on YouTube, on uh, the uh, television, the Channel 17 in Sacramento, and, of course, now on Facebook. Thank you.